If you want to find your seats, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes. Just about a minute or so, and we're going to get started. Stand with me if you would. We're going to sing Our God Reign. So you might have a paper with you or it's going to be on the screen either way. But we're going to sing Our God Reigns as our first song this evening.
sin and guilt that bruised and wounded him. It was our sin that brought him down. When we like sheep had gone astray, our shepherd came and on our Would you open us up in prayer this evening? Lord, we believe with all of our heart and have great assurance that you reign. Not that you will reign one day. We know that one day you will put down all power and you will rule on this earth from Jerusalem. We know, Lord, that even now you rule in the affairs of men. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for all the promises that you've given to us, that we might take your gospel message and go to every nation, every tongue, every tribe, and every people. Thank you for your authority. Thank you for your power. And Lord, we pray tonight that as you have so faithfully done over these last couple of years, and as you've beautifully done this last week, would you please speak to our hearts? Lord, we'd like to hear from you. We know that we have a mission to accomplish. We know that there's much work to be done. We know there's a lot to be done in us and then through us. We ask and pray, Lord, that tonight the message that comes from God's Word will continue to accomplish that in our lives. We just want to say how much we love you. We pray the service tonight with your presence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Turn in your hymnals, if you would, to 102. I stand amazed in the presence. One, zero, two. And when you read the song, just think about the, the focus of the song is Jesus, his love for us, is, it's very personal. It's not just a generic, he loves everybody on earth, although he does, but he loves you and me specifically and personally. So, one, oh, two. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Deep breath. 
Let's sing 545. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? 545. sinful soul like mine. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful it is to me? Boundless as the universe around me, reaching to the farthest soul away. Seven oh five. We're going to sing through those choruses. Seven oh five. So we're just going to sing the one, go into the next, all the way up to seven oh eight. Seven zero five. Isn't he wonderful?
617. I'll fly away. I hope this world isn't your home. Because if it is, you're going to be mighty disappointed one day. 617, I'll fly away. Good, very good. Um, so before we go to the preaching tonight, I want to introduce to you Brother um, Eddie Mills, um, who will be speaking on Sunday along with Brother Matt Stallman. Uh, Brother Mills and Mrs. Mills have been missionaries in China for 28 years and are praying about new opportunities in that region of the world. And so I'd like him to come and just introduce himself, share his testimony, how God called him, and sort of explain the ministry, and uh, familiarize yourself with him a little bit before Sunday. So, yeah, thank you, brother. Good evening. How many has been to China? Anybody? Got one? Everybody raise your hand. You've been to Walmart, right? <laughs> no. Right. If you've been to Walmart, you've been to China. Now, I say that as a joke, but I also say that because does that, does, shouldn't that make us think about something? You know, right now, you know, China is so much involved in world uh, economy, you know, world politics, world everything. You can't do anything without knowing something about China. Now, 28 years ago, uh, I was a sergeant in the United States Air Force at the time, and God called me. I was selected for White House duty, but God had a little change of direction for me. Got out of the Air Force, went to Bible school. Then when I was in the Bible school, I had a chance to join the National Guard, which is the Army side. So I've worn Air Force blue and Army green. So I've had two sides of the uniform. And, but God used a lot of my military experience to prepare me for the mission field. The things I learned uh, in the military, being on general staff, really prepared me because I was in charge of education for the state of Alabama's National Guard, 27,000 thousand troops. And, but in 93, when God called me to China, I was kind of just shocked. I was already preaching in juvenile facilities and jails and prisons and really thought that's what God would have me to do. And uh, but little by little, I, I realized that was even preparation for things in China. And uh, But in 93, God called us to China in March of 93. And really five months later, we were in China. Amen. And we've been there for 28 years now. Churches have been started. They're pastored by Chinese pastors. They're self-supporting. So we've got eight churches established there. We're on the island of Hainan, which is right below Hong Kong next to Vietnam. It's basically like if you put your finger on Cuba on this side of the world and follow that latitude line all the way around, then you'll end up in or Hainan is right next to Vietnam and kind of uh, below Hong Kong. It sits in the South China Sea. What does that mean to people today, the South China Sea? <laughs> the South China Sea is constantly in news. If you watch anything about our Navy, our, our Navy ships are always there, you know, doing uh, different exercises. 
uh, on the coast of Taiwan, things like that. But we've been on that island now for 28 years. We know most of the officials there. The officials know who we are. Uh, people say, do they know you're a Christian? Yes. I didn't hide the fact I was a Christian when I was in the military, and I don't hide the fact that I'm a Christian there. And they do know I'm a Christian. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being a Christian in China. There's a lot of false information out there about you know what China does. Uh, they don't hate Christian. They don't hate the church. They just hate uh, different missionaries who come in and make a political stance on things in China. And so we do know how to operate there. Uh, God's blessed in our ministry, uh, not just to be able to start churches, but to bring teams in. We've been bringing teams from Pensacola Christian College since uh, 2007. And a lot of the uh, young education majors in, at the college, would, uh, they don't realize they can be used in missions. And I would, I would tell them, you know, you might not be called to missions, but that doesn't mean you can't be used Amen. in missions. And so a lot of these young people come up to me and say, Mr. Mills, I'm an elementary ed major or, or, or secondary education or English major. I said, yes, you're what we need. And they'll come and spend the month of July with us in China. And then once they get there, kind of see the field, smell it, taste it, you know, realize it. They say, well, Mr. Mills, upon graduation, I could give a year to missions. And it's a shame that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, which uh, religious group upon graduating from college, they must give two years to missions? Mormons. Now think about that. They must, and they do, and they go all over the world. Why can we not challenge our young people upon graduation from college to give a year to missions? And we've been doing that since 2007, so we've been taking a large team to China since 2007. And many of them, upon going for the summer, they'll realize upon graduation, you know, I can do this. I can go to the mission field. I can use what I've been trained in education to give that to the Lord. Many of them come and get, after one year, they say, well, Mr. Mills, can I stay another year? Now, of course, I'm not going to refuse them. <laughs> and then some say, can I stay another year? I said, well, well of course, as long as your mom and daddy says it's okay in your church. And then we've had some, uh, we've got, uh, my wife's mind, we've got some that's uh, starting their fifth year right now. Another one's uh, doing their fourth year. And they were never called to missions. And we had one that went home just right before COVID. She was there in her 13th year. But she came home because no guys were coming to the mission field. No guys were coming to the mission field. I want you all to let that sink in. No guys were coming to the mission field. Why do I have many single ladies over there who are willing to go and teach? You say, well, all girls are teachers. No. Why we got no men teachers? Why? Do we wonder why our boys are sometimes a little too soft? Who's teaching them everything? See, everything that we see in society today it goes back to something that's, where men are not involved in education, in churches, on the mission field. And for whatever reason, it's like men are more interested in hunting, fishing. Nothing wrong with those things. Really nothing wrong with those things. Nothing wrong. But you know what? Sooner or later, we've got to realize we've got to teach our young men, which I like seeing this over here, the guys involved in music. That's great. That's really great. That's great preparation for them. But, you know, one day that, that could be somebody who's ready to go to the mission field right there. And you're preparing some young, young men, and that's great. But so guys got us in China. We've been here for 28 years. We're locked out because of COVID right now. But uh, I'm not just satisfied with uh, China. China's a big place, but... Uh, God's allowed me to work with the Beijing officials in a very close relationship to, to get some things uh, done in China. And, uh, but we're looking at expanding to North Korea. And we really need your prayers about that, uh, to go into North Korea. It takes special documentation that comes from our State Department in Washington. I'm working through our state representative of Alabama. I guess you all can tell I'm not from around here, right? Is it obvious or? It's the tie. It's the tie. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it might have been my hair cut for a while, you know, I don't, but, you know, my hair maybe, but, you know, <laughs> but anyway, but we're all working on some things about North Korea right now, and as you know, North Korea is completely a closed door in many ways, but, uh, you know, are there any closed doors with God? No closed doors, 
And you know, a lot of times for something to open is something that we have to pursue first. And I believe that the churches will pray along with us about this opportunity that God will give us a chance to go through those, do those doors. Yep. And uh, as those doors open, what I hope to do is be able to duplicate what we've done in China when we started about 28 years ago. Now, back in those early years of China, it was very difficult, very, you know, very, you know, uh, very underground, things like that. Now, China's pretty much a booming economy. They, they don't mind you having church as long as you're not passing out literature and things like that. But um, North Korea is a whole different ball game. But I hope to be, be able to operate from inside the country, and there won't be a lot done the first few years. But little by little, as you have a presence there in the country, God will move, and some doors open here, and some doors open there. But for that to ever happen, of course, we've got to have a, a way to get in the country. And so we're working on that right now. So pray for our, our teams in China, pray for our churches in China, and pray that we'll be able to get back at the end of this year. But pray more importantly for the doors to North Korea to open, that we might be able to have a presence in that country. Thank you, Pastor. When Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth, go ye therefore and teach open nations, receptive nations, you know, all. And you know the word power, there's two basic Greek words for power, exousia and dunamis. And exousia um, is the, the, the authority, basically, permission, permission from God. Um, Satan considers himself the god of this world, but all principalities and powers have been spoiled by Jesus' death on the cross. So there's there's no gate that hell can put up that is that means it's closed to God, to His church, to go forth into those nations. There does have to be wisdom in how to go about uh, getting into those nations and those countries. And, you know, part of the prayers that we've been praying in our church is that God will um, open doors into, um, and I, I, I like the term restricted access better than closed because um, nothing's closed to God. Access is, can be severely restricted. But, you know, over this last couple of years, we've had the privilege of meeting several people who are working in countries um, not through normal channels, let's say. In, in that means. And so we're grateful. And uh, Brother Mills will be with us all day Sunday along with Brother Matt Stallman. So looking forward to a great Sunday and praying for all of our boys and girls. Um, this thing about called to missions, called to missions. We use a lot of terms and I, I know what that means. I understand that, that God calls men to be pastors, evangelists, etc. But we are commanded, like we were commissioned, commanded to go to all nations and to every creature. And sometimes I think we hide behind the call not to obey the command, which is to go. And I'm sure that God will call certain people to go and, and stay in certain places, but why can't the entire church, you, th you think of a ministry like they have there, in order, what they do, they go into schools and they provide teachers into government schools in China. And as they go and teach effectively and do a good job at teaching, that gives them a presence there. And then the other work that they do, I think what he say, it's the one I open, one I closed, because they do such a good job in the education arena that they are. They don't mind the, the Christian work that's going on, provided it doesn't look like you're trying to cause a revolution um, in the country. So, uh, but you need people who aren't pastors. Like sometimes we think the only way you can be a missionary is if you're actually the one preaching. Um, but in Fiji, we were blessed. We've had five different um, ladies who were single missionaries. They were not married. And they came and they were involved in many things, especially through our school and some of our other work. And there is as much fruit or more fruit abounding to the women who labored in the ministry as to any male preaching missionary that's been there. And that's just the sad. It's not sad that women are doing that. It's sad that less men are, are doing that. And the, 
And Paul talks often about the women, uh, the Phoebes, um, those women that helped in the ministry. So don't think because you're a lady that um, the only thing you can do is cook and clean and sew and all of that. Um, there are amazing things you can do in service to your God as well. And their ministry in China is... A t what do you think the percentage of teachers that have come through all these 26 years, what percentage of them have been female and what percentage have been male? I'd say it was three, four, seven of them female. Yeah, three, four, so. So 75% of the workforce they've needed have come from young ladies, not from young men. So just let that sink in just a little bit. And that's not derogatory towards the girls at all. It's just, where's the guys? Like, where are the, the guys who will give their life for it? So, all right, Brother Jacob, let's have one more song, and then, Pastor, you can just come right after that. Thank you again for coming. It's been a great week. We're looking forward to the final message tonight. All right, stand with me if you would. We're going to sing 387, Because He Lives. Woo! 387.
Michael. It's your birthday today, right? How old are you? Ten years old. Woo! All right. Well, let's sing him happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Well, amen. It's Friday night, hard to believe. The week has come and gone. Some of you have been here every single night. Many of you, most of you have been here every single night. God bless you. It's been good to see you every night. Thank you for your kindness, your hospitality. Uh, thank you just for welcoming us, allowing us to come and minister this week. Uh, it's been good to be here. Got a kind note from a young man last night. Thank you for that. Thank you for the good feedback. And, and uh, just been a blessing to be here with you. Many years ago, a couple got married. And uh, they, they committed that they would have no secrets in their marriage. The wife said before they got married, she said, but there's, there's one thing. She says, I, ha I have a box that I don't want you to get into. And so I'm going to ask you to commit to not get into that box. And the husband-to-be said, well, okay, I, I, sounds good, fair enough. And so they got married, and, and that box was in the corner of the closet, on her part of the closet, and Year after year, the man kept that, that promise. He didn't get into the box. And it, from time to time, he would eat at him. You'd think, what's in that box? Now, what could be so special about that box or secret about that box? But he'd made a commitment. He was going to honor it. And months would go by, and he wouldn't think anything of it. And then he'd, he'd be in the closet, and he'd kind of see that box in the corner. And he's, man, he just so badly wanted to look at that box. But he didn't. Years went by, years went by. Finally, they came to the place. They celebrated their 50th anniversary, 50 years being married. And he thought, man, it's been 50 years. That box has been in the closet for 50 years. I've, I've never looked in it. Man, I wonder what's in that box. Well, after they'd been married 50 years, a few months later, the wife said she wanted to go visit her sister in another state, and she was going to be gone for about a week and a half. And so he took her to the airport. She flew out of town. He came home, and he opened up the closet, and he looked at that box. No, no, I've, I've, I've kept that promise all these years. And, but each day, it just began to call him, just stronger and stronger. And, and he thought, you know what? I, I've, I haven't looked in it for 50 years. I'm just going gonna, gonna to get it out. I'm just going to look in it. I'll put it back. I won't touch anything. So he gets the box out of the closet, he puts it on the bed, he takes the lid off the box, and there's three and a half crocheted dolls. There's, there's three complete dolls, and there's a half a crocheted doll. That kind of got his attention, but what really got his attention was under the crocheted dolls was just a pile of cash, just 20s and 100s and 50s, and I mean, just the box was full of money. And he thought, what is going on? So he kind of counted it without disturbing it too much, and, and as best he could determine, there was something like about $70,000 in the box. He thought, man, I wonder what in the world. But he put the lid back on the box, and he put it back in the closet, and a few days later, his wife came back, and now he's just eaten up with guilt. Just feels terrible. So after about three days, his wife one day says, honey, is something wrong? No, I'm okay. He says, no, 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 you're acting different. So I'm all right. He says, no, no, I can tell something's bothering you. He said, well, okay. He said, when you were gone to see your sister, he said, I, I got out the box. She said, you did? He said, yeah. Did you look in it? I, yeah, I did. Okay. She said, um, you have any questions? <laughs> He said, actually, I do. He said, there were three crochet dolls, and then there was a half of crochet doll. He says, oh, that's easy. She said, when, when, before I got married, my, my mother told me, said, look, don't fight with your husband. He's going to do things that are going to irritate you. He's going to do things that make you mad. Don't fight. Just go off someplace. Get a hobby, like maybe 
make dolls or something and, and just wait till you cool off and, and, and that'll, that'll help your marriage. And the man thought, 50 plus years, three and a half dolls, that's husband of the year material right there. <laughs> Maybe husband of the decade. He said, okay, that makes sense. He said, what about all that money? He says, oh, that's what I made from selling dolls. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, so James chapter 4 tonight. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We preach tonight on the weapons of our warfare. The weapons of our warfare. Let's pray. Dear God, we want to thank you for meeting with us this week, working in hearts and lives. Thank you for blessing. Lord, thank you for the joy of just being able to come to church, to be with your people, sing praises to your name, and be able to study your word. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for the joy of good fellowship. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together. And Lord, in the final night of this week, we ask that you'd meet with us, that you'd work in hearts, give us wisdom. Lord, may everything we say and do bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. We use the term, as we mentioned earlier this week, life-changing far too freely, far too often probably, but tonight's message could be life-changing for you. I, I hope it will be. I pray that it will be. I want to talk to those of you who really, really want to do right. You really, really want to live for God. You want to have victory in your Christian life. We're told in the Bible to flee fornication. We're told in the Bible to flee idolatry. We're told to flee covetousness and a love of money. We're told to flee youthful lust. But here in a remarkable passage, we are not told to flee the devil but rather to resist him, and he will flee from us. We are to resist him, we are to oppose him, we are to withstand him, and he will flee from us. What does that mean? Can we as a Christian, as a child of God, just go anywhere we choose? Try to resist the devil when he comes around? Are we able to see what we want, hear what we want, do what we want, experience what we want, and, and then just try to stand at the last minute, withstand at the last minute to keep from falling into sin? No, that's not what this passage is teaching. That would clearly violate many passages of Scripture. Proverbs 22, 3, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. The simple, the man without understanding, passeth on and is punished. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your own heart will betray you. Your own heart will turn on you. Your own heart will lead you in a way that's not good. Ephesians 4.27 tells us neither give place to the devil. Don't give him place. Someone said you give the devil an inch and he'll become a ruler. Uh, don't, don't give him place. Don't give him space in your life. Proverbs 4.14, enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it and turn away. Turn from it and pass away. Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That word occasion in the Greek means literally a starting point. A starting point. God says don't give your flesh a starting point. Amen. That's where we win and lose the battle. Don't give your flesh a starting point. When Eve was in the Garden of Eden, she gave her flesh a starting point when she saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired. She gave her flesh a starting point. We're not to give our flesh a starting point. We're not to, uh, in any way, uh, give it place, if you will. And that's why, guys, it's pretty dumb to go to the beach where women are running around half naked. I'll just be blunt with you. He's all, oh, that, that stuff doesn't bother me then you got more problems than the rest of us. Because God made you where that's supposed to affect you. 
And so a prudent man foresees the evil. There's places we as children of God aren't supposed to go. Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We get in trouble when we make provision for the flesh. He says, don't make provision, don't make allowance for the flesh. We're not to go seeking out temptation. We're not to purposely subject ourselves to the devil's attacks. We're not to go looking for trouble. Right. Trouble and temptation can find us easily enough. We don't need to go find it. It'll find us. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We're to be on guard. We're to be alert. If pastor got up tonight and announced, hey, there's, there's been a mountain lion spotted in the area around the church. When you go to your car, be careful. You would probably walk out of here in a little different way. There's a mountain lion in the area. And yet that mountain lion's probably never hurt anybody, never killed anybody. But most people would leave pretty cautiously. Except for junior high boys, they would be out hunting it after the service. <laughs> but after he tells us to, to be sober, to be vigilant, to be watchful, because you have an enemy, you have an adversary, the very next verse he says, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Resist steadfast in the faith. So how do you resist the devil? How do you oppose the devil? How do you fight against the devil? You are given two really convenient weapons, offensively speaking, very convenient weapons. It's important that you know what you've been given and how to use them. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We live in these bodies and we live in this world in a physical environment. We walk in the flesh, but we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or of our flesh, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Those of you that have served in the military, you are given weapons, and you are trained extensively in how to use those weapons. If you don't know how to use the weapons, they're not going to do you any good. You have to know how to use them. We've been given weapons. Some of you tonight, you're frustrated because what you're trying now isn't working in your Christian life. It's just not working. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And if you were honest with yourself tonight, you'd say, I, I don't seem to be experiencing that. I, I don't have a lot of victory. I, I don't feel like I'm an overcomer. I feel like I'm being overcome. I feel more like a victim than a victor. F Ephesians 6.10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, a familiar passage of Scripture, in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places that's never been more evident in the history of America than it is tonight. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Paul tells the church in Ephesians that they are in a battle, a spiritual battle. And in verse 12, he tells them, he lets them know what kind of battle they're in. Again, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not a real battle, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He encourages them to be strong and to put on the armor of God so that they can stand and not be defeated. And then he goes through the various pieces of armor. 
and their specific and necessary uses in the Christian life. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. The truth is important. And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation. Now, up until this point, everything he has mentioned is for defensive purposes primarily. None of the first five things mentioned are offensive weapons. I suppose you could have taken a shield and, and beat somebody with it or headbutted somebody with your helmet, but really all the things mentioned to this point are defensive in nature. But then he mentions the sword. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. A sword is an offensive and a defensive weapon. It is used to defend. It's used to attack. It is used to repel an enemy and defend one's ground. And it is used to advance and to conquer. In Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness is called Verse 1, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus' three answers all contain the same phrase, It is written. What does that mean? Jesus responded to the devil all three times in the same way by using the word of God. Deuteronomy 8, 3, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live, by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Deuteronomy 6.16, ye shall not tempt the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 6.13, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Exodus 20 verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And so we find that Jesus did not argue with the devil. He did not reason with him. He just simply used the word of God. He took him back to the Old Testament and he used the word of God. And when the devil used the word of God incorrectly, Psalm 91, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus set him straight. And Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. There is tremendous power in the word of God and there are various ways in which you can use it. Psalm 199, wherever thou shalt a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Jesus would say in John 15, 3, now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Set them apart through thy truth. In Hosea 4, 6, he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, he's not talking about knowledge of geography or history or mathematics. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, knowledge of God, knowledge of his will, his word, and his way. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. In Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine, 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. What was the end result of Jesus using the word of God? Matthew 4, 11, then the devil leaveth him. Jesus didn't leave the devil, the devil left him. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The word of God is a sword and it is to be used offensively. 
I would encourage you to start memorizing the Word of God Amen. on your own. Just put it on three by five cards. Uh, just start memorizing verses that maybe issues in your life that are that are problem issues, issues that you struggle with, issues that are that are difficult for you that you're you're having a problem with, and just just general Bible knowledge. Just start memorizing the Word of God. Just start learning the Word of God. It will help you tremendously. We'll talk about two different ways you can use the Word of God and you can use prayer to directly resist the devil and make him flee from you. But it starts with you learning the Word of God and memorizing it. Joshua 1, 8, a familiar passage of Scripture, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success." Psalm 119, 104 says, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. I get understanding from your word. I get understanding from the word of God. Psalm 119, 24, thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Uh, people want to go get therapy. They want to go get counseling. The word of God will give you counsel. Amen. The Word of God will give you wisdom. It gives understanding to the simple, the Bible says. If we would just take heed to the Word of God. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's what the Word of God says. And so we'll get back to that in a little bit. But I believe we've been given another offensive weapon to use in the battle against the devil. The weapon of prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I'm watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Luke 18, 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, perhaps you've struggled for years in a certain area of your life. Maybe there's an area of your life that you just can't seem to get victory in. Let's say, for instance, that it's in your thought life. How do you flee? Where do you flee if the problem's in your own head? Wherever you go, your mind is still with you. It's hard to fight an enemy who has outposts in your head. And the devil can get you defeated so easily, and he can ruin an otherwise great day. So how do you resist the devil? How do you make him flee? We're not told to flee him. We're told to make him flee. How do we make him flee? You do need to use the Word of God. You need to start saturating your mind with God's Word. And obviously you can't keep filling your mind with garbage. Right. Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and every good work reprobate, you're not going to win the battle that way. But a lot of Christians are plagued by thoughts of things that happened long ago. Memories and desires that came about before they were even saved many times. that have been cultivated for years. There are some here tonight that maybe 30 years or 40 years of stuff before you got saved. And the devil's got a lot of junk to work with. The things you didn't even realize you were doing. And you can quote Philippians 4, 8 over and over again, but it seems like all the devil needs is one second to get into your mind. Maybe it's thoughts of discouragement and defeat. Maybe it's thoughts of lust. Maybe it's thoughts of pride. Maybe it's thoughts of anger. Maybe it's thoughts of bitterness or something somebody did to you 20, 30, 40 years ago. Maybe it's thoughts of depression. So then how does prayer become an offensive weapon? Well, the devil doesn't like to see you pray, I guarantee it. But most people, when they deal with an issue in their life, let's say it's a lustful thought and, and they've been trained and they know that they're supposed to confess that is sin and, and ask God to forgive them, and, and then they go on about their day. You're back to just square one or ground zero, if you will. But if you determine in your mind that when the devil comes along with those thoughts that he loves to plague you with, that it's going to drive you to your knees every single time. 
figuratively speaking, to your knees, whether you're driving or walking or wherever you might be, and not just to confess the wrong thoughts, but that you're going to pray about a few other things every single time. And I encourage people to keep the prayer list short so that you can always remember it. It doesn't have to be written down. You can remember it while you're driving. If anger is an issue while you're driving, you might have a few anger issues. If you don't hear, come down to where I live, and, and we can help you with that and bring those to the surface. <laughs> but, but those thoughts that you struggle with, and here they come again, so you determine that every single time, every single time, when that comes back, yes, you're going to ask God to forgive you for your anger or your lust or your depression or your bitterness or whatever it might be. But then I would encourage you to have a four thing, things on your prayer list. Number one, pray for your pastor. For your pastor. And so if you're plagued by thoughts of lust a dozen times a day, then a dozen times a day you're going to be praying that God blesses this man. That God would put his hand upon him. That God would protect him. That God would keep him from harm. That God would guide him and give him wisdom. You know, there's a lot of responsibility in caring over a flock. A lot of responsibility. And, and the decisions that pastors make that ripple out over dozens or scores or hundreds of lives multiply that pressure. Pray that God would give him strength. God would give him wisdom. God would guide and direct him. And then I encourage you to pray for the church as a whole. That God would bless this church. That there would continue to be a good spirit in this church. There would be a great spirit of unity. That the testimony in the community would not be marred by some foolish Christian. That God would bless this church and use it. Anywhere God is working, the devil is trying to destroy it. You need to know that. And so every time you're going to pray for this church, then I'd encourage you to pray for an unsaved person. It might be your neighbor. It might be a family member a thousand miles away. It might be your coworker. That guy maybe that gets on your nerves, Ralph that you have to work nobody here named Ralph, Ralph that you have to work with. And so if a, if a dozen times a day those thoughts of bitterness come back, then a dozen times a day you're praying, God, would you save Ralph? God, would you help me to be the witness I'm supposed to be? Would you help me to be the testimony? Would you help me to watch my tongue? Would you give me opportunity to witness to Ralph? Would you give me boldness? A dozen times a day, you're going to pray for Ralph. And then I'd encourage you, the fourth thing on your prayer list, another Christian you know that's going through a tough time. Somebody that you know is struggling. Whether it's financially, maybe their marriage is in trouble, maybe it's a health issue, maybe it's a Christian growth issue, and, and then they just seem to be stumbling along. And a dozen times a day, you're going to pray for them. God, would you help them? Would you give them strength? Just four things. Keep it short. You can remember it anywhere that way. And 1 Peter 1.13 says, gird up the loins of your mind. That means control your thoughts. And so now, instead of the devil controlling your thoughts, the devil dictating your thoughts, you're going to control your thoughts. And if the devil makes you a prayer warrior 12 times a day, guess what? He's going to get tired of making you a prayer warrior. And he'll find somebody else to go bother for a while. You're to make him flee. The weapons you've been given are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But you've got to use the weapons you make up your mind. You're going to pray every time the devil comes back. You know, after a while, he's going to get tired of that. Do you know why people speed, why they break the speed limit? Because most of the time they get away with it. Now, let's just suppose every time you went just three miles over the speed limit, you got a ticket. After a while, you'd quit speeding. I mean, if, if you got a brain... You'd be saying, this isn't worth it. This isn't working like it used to. I mean, now you might chance it. You're late to work. You're late to church. You want to be on time. Yeah, whatever it might be. But if you've got a ticket every time, after a while you figure out this isn't working like it used to. It's not worth it. You want the devil to figure out it's not worth it anymore with you. Because it used to be. He comes back and he could give you a thought of something, some 
previous relationship, something you saw, something you did, and there go your thoughts. Lust, and, and then you feel cheap and dirty, and, or, or, or thoughts of revenge, or thoughts of uh, bitterness, or thoughts of anger, or thoughts of covetousness, or thoughts of depression and worry, whatever it might be, before it worked in your life. You'd be having a great day, and then there's that thought. You can even be sitting in church and have those thoughts. And he's got you right where he wants you. And, and if you've trained him that it works with you, he can get you depressed really easily. Or he can get you filled with lust or covetousness or jealousy or whatever. But if all of a sudden it just makes you become a prayer warrior, it's not working like it used to work. Resist the devil. He'll flee. You know, if you get a little headache, you miss church. You'll start having headaches on Sunday quite often. You get a headache, just now I'm going to church. And I'm going to give more in the offering than never before because of that. We're to be overcomers. We're to be victorious. You're of God, little children, have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Never forget it's not you that's greater. It's he that is in you that is greater. Your trust and your faith must be in God and in his word, not in yourself. Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me you can do nothing. You can do nothing. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and haughty spirit before a fall. Paul would write to the Galatian church in chapter 1, verse 8, and say, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul didn't rule himself out. When he was writing to that church, he, he said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. He's saying, even the spiritual men, you need to understand, you don't reach a place where you can put it on cruise control. You don't put it on automatic pilot in your Christian life. And he says, even for the spiritual, when you go to restore that fallen brother, you better consider yourself because we're all one bad decision away from disaster. Your trust can never be in you. Your trust can never, cursed be the man that trusteth in man, Jeremiah says. Trust can never be in ourselves. Psalm 103 says, of God, he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we're dust. We need to remember that. Our dependency, even in resisting the devil, is in God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Some years back, a man in my church came to me. He said, Pastor, where I work, in my department, everybody has a filthy mouth. He says, all day long, I'm hearing people take God's name in vain. He said, they tell dirty jokes. He said, by the end of each and every day, he said, I feel dirty. He said, I go home every day feeling dirty. And I said, Larry, I said, why don't you take 10 three by five cards? Write out 10 verses that deal with your thought life, that deal with issues that are gonna help you in your Christian life. On the blank side of the card, write the reference. On the other side, write, on the line side, write the verse out. I said, take those 10 cards and put them in your pocket. I said, when you go to work tomorrow, the first time somebody cusses, just pull out those verses and start going over them. And you're going to learn those verses really quickly. He came to me the next week. He said, Pastor, he said, you wouldn't believe what happened. He said, I wrote out those 10 verses just like you said. He said, I put them in my pocket. He said, I went to work the next day. I was just waiting for somebody to cuss. He said, the whole day nobody cussed. <laughs> he said, nobody told a dirty joke. He said, now I've been transferred to another department, and it's a better place, and, and nobody cusses over there. I said, now it doesn't usually work that easily. You're going to get some pushback. Another man in my church had come to me, and he said, Pastor, he, he, he does, they do huge excavations, a rock quarry. He said, Pastor, he said, I, I'm really fighting some really dark thoughts. He said, some really dark thoughts. He said, it scares me, some of the thoughts that go through my mind. Dark thoughts. He said, it's starting to really weigh me down. And I told him, in essence, the same thing, some of what I'm telling you tonight, and take those 10 verses and 
I saw him the next week, and I said, How, how's everything going? He said, Pastor, he said, I did what you said. I, I had the 10 verses in my pocket. He said, we, we had dug a, about a 90-foot hole. We'd excavated this big hole. And he said, I was leaning over, looking into the hole. He said, all my verses fell into the hole, 90 feet down. I said, what'd you do? He said, I wrote out 10 new ones. Amen. That's what you have to do. Amen. That's what you have to do. You have to stick with it. You have to mean it. Some years back, hired a man to come and fix our ceiling. His name was Roque. Real big bear of a guy, just a big guy. Working on our ceiling, I started witnessing to him. And he said, well, he said, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. He trusted Christ. He said, but I, he said, I'll be honest with you right now, I'm, I'm not doing that well. I'm struggling. He said, I'm a Christian, but I guess I'm what you call backslidden. And so I started talking to him, and he started sharing his life, and and I'm sharing a, a lot of what I'm sharing tonight with you and how to overcome temptation and how to be victorious. And, and he finished the job and I paid him and he left. And, and I didn't think much more about it. About two months later, I was in a store. There was Roque. He saw me. He came over. He just gave me a big hug. He says, what you told me works. He says, what you told me has helped me so much. He says, I, I'm doing so much better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This big guy, just thrilled that it was going well. Just a few weeks ago, a man texted me, used to be in our church, was in our church for a couple years, was a meth addict, and his life was a mess. And it really took about two years to get him straightened out and doing better. And he, had, he fell down, got up, fell down, got up. And after two years, of, he was growing, but he finally one day he came to me, he said, Pastor, he said, I... I've, I've grown up in this area, and he said, I, I don't think I can live here anymore. He said, I drive down the street, I know I, I can get meth there. I can get drugs there. Oh, I know I can get some there. He says, everything's a memory. And he says, I love the church, don't want to leave the church. He said, but I, my wife and I, we're going to move. And he told me they're going to move about an hour and a half away. And so he did, and we've been in communication and just try to help him through some things. And, and, and a few weeks ago, he texted me. He said, Pastor, can I? Can I call you? When's a good time to call you? And so I just, I just called him right away. I said, I said, Gary, what's going on? He said, Pastor, he said, my, my thought life from some things in my past, he said, I'm, I'm not doing very well. He said, my daughter, he has a teenage daughter. He said, my daughter's not doing well either. We're, we're both struggling. We're both struggling spiritually. And so I told him some of what I told you tonight and called him a couple of weeks later. He said, Pastor, he said, I'm doing fine. It works. It really works. He said, my daughter's doing fine. He said, we're doing well, Pastor. Thank you so much. We're, we're just doing well. I'm, I'm starting to really have victory in my thought life and starting to win some battles. You know, we're still sinners in a sin-filled world. And, and the day you stop sinning is the day you die, just so you know. This, this isn't, we're not teaching sinless perfection. If you get this down, you'll never sin again. But I'm telling you, you'll start having victory a whole lot more often. A lot of Christians are just living a defeated, I just, I guess I can't do it. I don't measure up. And they dedicate their life, and they rededicate their life, and they re-rededicate their life, and they re-re-rededicate their life, and think, well, this time it's going to work, and this time I'm going to pray a little harder, and I'm going to pray a little longer, and I'm going to be more sincere, and I'm going to cry, and, and then they fall flat on their face again. We live in a sin-filled, sin-cursed world. And Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. And though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And I would encourage you when you, when you fall down, and you will, get back up. Get back up. And go on. And, and get back in the battle. Get back in the race. And get back to praying faithfully. And get back to using the word of God as the weapons that they've been given to you. And keep short accounts with God. Always keep short accounts with God. Don't let things fester. Don't say, I'll, I'll take care of that tomorrow. I'll, I'll deal with that another time. I, I got things to do. No, always, always take care of things with God. First John 1, 7 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And look at the last part of the verse. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Even though we're walking in light, even though we're walking in fellowship, because we're such evil, wicked people by nature, there's going to be times we're going to mess up. We're going to sin. 
But get back up and walk in the light and know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You're not deceiving anybody else. You can walk around telling people, I don't sin anymore. You're only deceiving yourself. Nobody in this church is going to believe you. But it says if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The wonderful thing about God, many wonderful things about God, obviously. But the Bible says that the blood of Christ refers to the Old Testament sacrifices. Then Hebrews 9.14 says, how much more so the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And as you draw closer to God, as you walk in the light, as you take the word of God and you use it as a weapon, you take the prayer and you use it as a weapon, you're going to find more and more your, your conscience becomes cleansed. First John 3.20 says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Yeah. <clears throat> Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. If our heart condemn us not. You may think, well, you know, after I've been saved a while, I, I'm sure I'll, I'll get to the place where, where my, my heart won't condemn me anymore. But, you know, sometimes after you've been saved a long time, you think, I've been saved 20 years, I'm still doing this. Your heart can still condemn you. You think, well, if I had grown up in a Christian home and I wouldn't have done all the things that I'd done and before I was saved, I wasn't saved until I was 25 or 28 or 30, then I'd be okay. But, and growing up in a Christian home was wonderful. But one of the things about growing up in a Christian home and getting saved at an early age is almost everything bad you've ever done is after you were saved. Yeah. Yeah. At least if you're 30, you say, well, I wasn't saved then. If you got saved at five, it's like, oh, I was saved then. But God doesn't want our hearts to condemn us. He'll, he'll, he'll cleanse our conscience. In Psalm 130, verse 3, the psalmist said, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Right. Who shall stand? But there's forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Thank God for that forgiveness. Jeremiah said, It was of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. In Micah chapter 7, verse 18, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Look at that last phrase. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He delighteth in mercy. He doesn't forgive you just because he said he would, just because he obligated himself. He forgives you because he delights in mercy. Amen. He delights in mercy. He delights in mercy. He delights in mercy. When, when 1 John 1, 9 says he's faithful and just, that means you're never going to catch God on a bad day. Yeah. Faithful, he always will forgive you. God doesn't say, are you kidding, you again? Right. I've got Christians that haven't come in a whole day because they haven't done anything wrong. This is the third time today. No, he's faithful and just. Amen. He'll always forgive you. Amen. He'll always forgive you if you come. Goes on to say, he'll turn again and he'll have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That was before the cross, and so now the sins are just washed away. They're, they're gone completely. But from a God that delights in mercy, the devil will like to tempt you, tempt you, tempt you, tempt you, and when you fall, accuse you, accuse you, accuse you, accuse you. And there are a lot of Christians walking around defeated and guilty and feeling miserable, and they don't measure up, and I don't even know if I should keep going to that church because I just can't live this Christian life. No, you can't. Without him, you can do nothing. But he's given you weapons. And if you'll use the weapons, you find that they work. If you're a police officer and you say, I don't think I need that club. I don't want to carry that gun around that's heavy. And those handcuffs, they just kind of bang. Like, ah, I don't want those. And the radio. And, and you try to go out there in sweats and a T-shirt and tennis shoes. You may be able to do it for a while, but there'll come a day when you wished you'd taken the weapons. Yeah. If you're a soldier and you say, ah, this thing weighs a lot, I think I'll just get a super soaker. They're lighter. 
And you can't blame the military when you get in trouble. Right. Because you didn't take the weapons. Preach, Stay there for a the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but what? Mighty. God's given us mighty weapons to pull down strongholds. And yet there are a lot of Christians defeated by the strongholds in their life. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. For, for 30 years, I've looked at pornography. For 30 years, I've drunk alcohol. For 30 years, I've taken drugs. For 30 years, I've had this temper. For 30 years, I've been bitter. For thir Those are strongholds. Those are strongholds. And we'd like to excuse our behavior because, well, this is all I know. And my dad got angry, too. And my grandpa got angry. And I think it goes all the way back. Yeah, all the way back to Adam. They're all sinners. <laughs> But those strongholds in your life that keep you defeated and keep you not doing well in your Christian life, God doesn't want us living that way. He says we can be overcomers, we can be victorious. But we've got to use the weapons. He doesn't say take off and run from the devil. He says resist him. I've given you good weapons. If you'll use them, you'll find that they work. And where sin abounded, Romans 5.20 tells us, Grace did much more abound. Whatever area there is in your life that you struggle with, that area that causes you such grief, such a guilty conscience, such defeat, you take the weapons that God has given you and say, you know what? An all-wise God didn't leave me to fight this Christian battle unarmed. If he's given me weapons... I'm guessing they work. The disconnect is we don't use the weapons that he's given us, but we use them incorrectly. You've been given weapons that are mighty that will help you have victory in your Christian life. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, a thought went through my mind, <laughs> defeated on purpose. Defeated on purpose. Satan is not... He's powerful to those who don't have the weapons that are described in the Bible. But if you're armed with the weapons that God gives, you submit to God, you resist the devil, and he flees. Think of that. You don't fight the devil. He flees when you resist him. That was a couple really interesting things. I'd never thought about it that way. You imagine every time that temptation comes to your mind, you pull out those four things and you pray through them every single time. It'd be hard for your mind to dwell on the, the thing that was attacking it when immediately you default go to those things of prayer and probably have a little revival, you know, and a little bit later it happens again, and there you go right back to that. It's very funny. Um, Louis will tell you, we sat down for a couple hours today. Does it not feel like he spied on our conversation today? Just so you know, I didn't say one word to, to him. But what's, what's amazing is that when you're really seeking God, God will validate um, truth. So we have a, a Bible memory uh, exercise that we've been doing as a church. So I want you to think of how many weeks in a row you've come to church and not given um, not, not checked any of those memory verses off of that list. You, you ever think why? It's not because you don't want to. Because every Sunday that comes around and you see the numbers go up, you're like, next week I'll have some memory verses to go on there. I really want to. Why, why is it easy to scroll Facebook and difficult to scroll the Bible? Yeah, be, because the flesh doesn't want to lose control. The flesh and the devil have been in partnership for a long time, and they don't want to lose control, and those are very spiritual things. But you have to stop making excuses. You have to stop saying, I'm going to get around to that eventually, and you have to start doing it. It is not as hard as you think. Memorizing Scripture is not hard. It is not hard to memorize Scripture. I met a new brother tonight. This is Mike. Right? Mike just flew into Wenatchee um, yesterday. Is going to be here for six months to a year, depending on a job. And I said, well, how'd you find our church? And he said, I've been to 25 or so different RUs, wherever work takes him. He finds wherever a local RU chapter is, and he gets here. 
So I met him. I talked to him for two minutes before the service tonight. I know his name. I knew that he flew into Wenatchee. I knew that he got here yesterday. I know that he's been about to 25 different RUs. I memorized those things. So why is it that people say, I can't memorize the scripture? You can, you can memorize all kinds of things. That in itself is a stronghold. That is a lie of the devil that you can't memorize. Highly educated people that memorize all kinds of things for life say, I can't memorize the scripture. You should know that Satan hates the scripture because that is a weapon that he cannot stand against. He can't stand against it. So very good. You know what? Victory is ours. Victory is given to us. The victorious Christian life is our inheritance as born again children of God. We should experience it regularly. You don't have to live your whole life into defeat. All right. Thank you. Maris, why don't you come just play? Let's have a quiet time of prayer. Um, it's been a lot of things this week and a very great message tonight. So let's just spend a couple of moments uh, in prayer together before we close off uh, the evening.